Hey everybody, it's me, John Lorden. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked for today, Tuesday, July 4th, 2017. I wish all of you that are watching within the US a wonderful Independence Day. I hope you guys are going out, having some fun, maybe getting to play with some fireworks. And if you live in a place that'll support that, like I do now, I really love it, being able to <laughs> play with fireworks again. Um, but we got to get to today's case. And before we get started, I want to thank Babble Froggy, who has been a longtime friend of the show. She has done research on several cases for me. Thank you so much for letting me know about this case, Babble Froggy. Truly appreciate it. Today, we are looking into the case of Melanie Road. June 9th, 1984. Melanie Road was 17 years old, a happy, outgoing, and sociable young woman, full of life with a bright future ahead of her. She was about to take her A-levels, essentially her tests for finishing high school, that following week. She loved to bake for her friends and family. Her family lived in a neighborhood known as St. Stephen's Close in Bath in the United Kingdom. Melanie was the youngest of three children. She had a brother, Adrian, as well as a sister named Karen, and her mother was a teacher. Uh, that night, she had just wrapped up a night out with friends at a local nightclub called Bo Nash. And around 1.30, she kissed her boyfriend goodbye and started her walk home. Uh, it was only a 15-minute walk, but she had no idea that there would be danger awaiting her on that path home. Witnesses would state that they saw her walking with a young man on the opposite side of the road following about 50 yards behind her. Around 2 a.m., a local woman reports hearing a woman scream. Others say that they hear a man making odd sounds in the middle of the night. Melanie's body would be discovered by a milkman and his 10-year-old son at 5.30 that same morning. She was close to some garages only a short distance from her home. She was stabbed 26 times, and investigators would learn she was also sexually assaulted. They found a key ring nearby with the name Melanie written on it, but had no other means of identifying her. They drove around in a police car with a loudspeaker, saying the name Melanie over and over again. Her parents woke up to find that Melanie hadn't slept at home. Her mother was sure she was fine, probably just stayed at a friend's house and would be calling any minute, but instead they heard a loudspeaker outside calling their daughter's name. Their nightmare would begin as they learned what happened, and it would continue for decades as they searched for justice. Police were able to track her blood and saw the path of where the attack happened and she, how she ran into a cul-de-sac to try to escape. Samples were collected from the scene and neighboring areas, including blood samples of another blood type that trailed off into a completely different direction. Only 3% of the population has this blood type. Over the next five years, 94 people were arrested but not charged, and hundreds were questioned. Despite what most agree was a fine example of police work, the case would eventually go cold. In 1995, a DNA profile of the killer was put into the national database. There were no immediate matches found. In 2003, a cold case team was created, and in 2008, they did a specific review of all unsolved murder cases. However, unfortunately, once again, no major developments would happen. The TV show Crime Watch featured a special on the 25th anniversary of Melanie's death. 70 names were handed over to police, but once again, no breakthroughs, no major developments would come out of all this. Meanwhile, Christopher Hampton was a loving family man by all appearances, working as a painter decorator. He had no criminal history, was in his second marriage, and had fathered four children, three in his first and one in his second marriage, as well as raising his new wife's son from a previous relationship. Chris's daughter from his first marriage, Claire, was arrested in 2014 for a petty domestic dispute around the age of 41. Apparently she got in an argument with uh, her significant other and broke his necklace. That charge would eventually turn into a warning or a caution for criminal damage, but 
Her DNA was collected at that time and added to the police database. In 2015, Gary Mason, a retired officer who returned to work with the cold case team, decided to look for familial matches on their unsolved cases. Claire's DNA became a partial match against the DNA of the attacker of Melanie Road over 30 years prior. The familial match told police that she was related to the person who assaulted and killed Melanie. They quickly tracked her down and began reviewing her family. Of the men, they knew her brothers were too young to commit the crime. That left only her father. A DNA sample was taken from the 62-year-old Christopher. It would take several weeks for the cold case team to get results, but tests confirmed he was indeed the culprit. The cold case team cracked open a bottle of champagne that had been sitting aside for two and a half years, waiting for the right success to be opened. Cracking a 30-year-old case seemed to be the right time. Christopher was arrested on July 2, 2015. Though he would initially deny being involved, he would later admit in court that he was indeed the culprit and plead guilty to her murder. Melanie's mother, Jean Road, now 81 years old, who still lives in the same home, was worried she would die without seeing her daughter's killer face justice. Quote, he's not a man, he's a monster. How could he do that? I feel like he should be shut up in a dungeon like they used to do in the olden days and just left to rot. It seems she's gotten a result pretty close to what she was hoping for. Christopher has received a life sentence. He won't be released for a minimum of 22 years, meaning it's very likely that he will die in prison. When he committed the brutal act, he was separated from his first wife and living with his then girlfriend. Police believe that his current wife knows nothing about the murder. He was able to continue his life without being caught for any other crimes, avoiding having his DNA entered into that police database for decades. Christopher has made no comments to the Road family, no apology for the pain he inflicted on them over the course of 32 years, and gave literally no signs of remorse or regret. Melanie's mother recalls the haunting last words she heard from her daughter. She was dropping Melanie off outside the Francis Hotel in Bath so Melanie could go play tennis with her friends. Melanie leaned over, gave her sister a kiss on the cheek, and then she got out of the car and said, look, there's a red carpet laid out for me. What a way to go. I wish the Road family peace and healing in dealing with all this. Um, and quite honestly, I wish that at some point Christopher could get back in touch with his humanity and maybe give them the few words that he could, that will help s give them at least some sort of comfort in terms of what he did to their daughter. But I'm really not sure if that's going to happen. I also wanted to let you know that while researching this case, I did bump into some articles that were alluding to the fact that he might be related to another similar case that happened a number of years later, but it happened on the same day. Um, I didn't see very compelling information for the connections there, but just in case you want to dive into that, I have included a link in the description box below so you can look into that a bit more. Uh, my personal feeling is that he did he did such a, a good job of keeping off the police's radar. I'm not sure that he would have tried to tempt fate again by committing a crime like that again, but uh, I don't know. I don't think that that case is quite finalized yet, and they haven't solved it in any other manner. So I think the question of is he related to that case will probably float around for some time to come. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of Case Cracked. I hope you and your family are doing well. And like I said, if you're in the U.S., hope you have a wonderful 4th of July. Please stay safe, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arch channel.